Tonight, we're so pleased to be presenting Jeremy Dink. Normally, when he steps onto the stage, there's a concert grand piano awaiting. Not tonight, though. He'll be speaking about his new book, Every Good Boy Does Fine, with, with Peter Dobrin, who covers classical music for the Inquirer. I would venture to say that Every Good Boy Does Not Do quite as fine as Mr. Dink has done. His concert schedule is always full, and we Philadelphians are lucky that he performs regularly for Philadelphia Chamber Music Society audiences. Not only is he a man of music, he's the recipient of a MacArthur Genius Grant, he's received Musical America's Instrumentalist of the Year Award, an Avery Fisher Prize, and has been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, among many other honors. He's also a man of words, a former blogger, author of countless articles and on classical music, program notes, and more. He's got the words and the music covered. I know we're all eager to hear tonight's conversation, so please do make sure your cell phones are silenced and remember that there will be a book signing after the lecture. Now, please join me in welcoming Jeremy and Peter to the stage. This might seem a, a little bit off topic, um, but uh, I don't know how many of you have been watching uh, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Um, but as I've been preparing for this, I, I kept on thinking about one episode in particular. And it's where uh, Mrs. Maisel uh, wanders into a cabaret club in Paris. And she's doing her routine on stage uh, for a little while. And she suddenly realizes that these beautiful women who are on stage with her in costumes and gowns, these, these chorus girls, are actually drag queens. Um, and she turns to them, and she's really, really angry, and she says, you know, it's not bad enough that men run the world. You have to look fabulous in a size four dress, too. Um, and, I, and I felt this way reading um, Jeremy's book these past couple of weeks, because I thought it's, it's not bad enough that you're a terrific pianist, but now you're also, you know, like a great writer as well. Um, <laughs> And, you know, so it's like, you know, some people get all the talent. Um, it's very kind um, of you to say. It, well, it's, it's a really, really terrific book, and I, I hope you all um, will read it the same way I did, which is um, through the, the ears of a, a very sensitive um, listener, um, because I think that that's... Um, you know, any, any book that encourages people to listen to classical music through sensitive ears and, and um, directs them to, to what's important in music, I think is a really um, worthy book. Um, and I was, I was reflecting on the fact that um, this is kind of a tradition um, among pianist writers. Um, I was thinking about a book um, that Arthur Schnabel wrote um, called Music, um, and the line of most resistance, um, in which he talks about the role of the artist in society. Um, and then I was thinking about a book that Gary Grafman wrote um, called I Really Should Be Practicing. Um, that's about Gary's favorite topic, which is Gary. Um, and and I, I say that with affection. I would say that if he were sitting here. Um, but um, Jeremy's book is, is somewhat different, um, and I'm wondering if you can, it's really all about Jeremy's education um, as an artist. It covers the years um, of his growing up and his um, path through various teachers and through college, and it, it stops at the point at which the Jeremy we know appears, which is at his professional career stage. Um, and I'm just wondering, Jeremy, if you can start by talking a little bit about why you chose to write about that period in, in your life. Um, it's, it's a long story, but um, I'll make it as brief as I can, which is that uh, the New Yorker approached me. I was writing a blog, right? And they, they wanted me to write something for them about being a musician. And I wrote a kind of comic piece about making a recording of Ives. And they were mm -hmm. like, well, that people like that. It was funny. and and. Um, and so they're like, what would you like to do next? And I was like, well, what I really want to do is write about my teacher, George Shebuk, who was an amazing Hungarian genius and pianist. And, 
and, uh, and he was, I encountered him in Bloomington, Indiana. And he changed my concept of what music was and the path of my life in many ways. And I'd really write, love to write this love letter to him. And the New Yorker people were, they were they're like, well, we do a lot of profiles. We don't really want to do that. So I was like, well, what if I take my earlier teacher 10 years earlier and I sort of do a flash forward and, and compare these two moments of my life, you know, when I'm 11 years old and 10 years old. And so that piece, Every Good Boy, was, Every Good Boy Does Fine, was born out of that lunchtime discussion. I think I had a martini during it. I'm not sure. Uh, but then it gave me the opportunity to write this love letter to my teachers. And then once that piece came out, and a lot of people read it and wrote to me about it, you know, uh, from all disciplines. Um, and then Random House was encouraging me to do something. And they're like, well, there's all these gaps. You know, what happened at Oberlin? And what happened before Oberlin? So I was like, you don't understand. Piano lessons are mostly really boring, right? Um, <laughs> But then, gradually, um, I began to become convinced. So that's the shortest answer I could do for that question. Sorry. No, 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 not at all. You know, you, you never quite come out and say it, I don't think, in the book. But really, what it is, is, is you, after you've read the entire book, you've left your reader with a way of listening to classical music. I mean, was that intentional? Um, I, yes, it was. I hope it was <laughs> semi into. You know, it's hard to say after writing this book over so, such a long time whether anything was really intentional. But um, I wanted to write the memoir parts, right? I wanted to write the stories of these teachers. At the same time, I also wanted to do some of the stuff that I liked doing when I was writing the blog, which is slightly irreverent, unusual takes on classical music, particular pieces that I've worked on. Mm -hmm. So I developed the idea of creating these sort of music lessons. Um, the fact is, though, that you know, all those teachers, each, once I figured out what the central revelation each teacher gave to me in one way or another, mm -hmm. the, when mm -hmm. I re reconstructed whatever scene it was, um, I think those lessons they gave me create hopefully in sequence a kind of new way of listening or a way that I like to listen to mm -hmm. music um, I don't know if that answers your yeah. question yeah, yeah. Um, some of it has to do with uh, hearing pieces not as if they're old and varnished over and you know mm -hmm. sitting in a museum but that oh. that you have the possibility like like I do every day, I sit and say, well, how should this Bach prelude go? Should it go faster or slower? Should I play a trill here? Should it be wild or should it be this and that? So I try to create a sense of that process for yeah. people who may not know that in their own lives. They listen. Of course, a lot of people encounter music through recording and it goes how it goes, right? And I do like to write to create that sense that you're practicing and you don't know how the music will go and it could go anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah we'll, we'll get to, I th think, some of those, you talked about those central lessons that you learned from particular teachers. I think you conveyed them really, really well and I want to get to a couple of those in a minute. Um, I, I thought it would be interesting to, to get a little bit of a flavor um, of your writing because you just write so well about music. Um, and this is just a couple of paragraphs, but um, here Jeremy is, is writing about opera, um, which obviously is, is not his, his, his day job. Um, but um, he's writing about Verdi's Falstaff, and he's writing about the point in the opera where Falstaff finds himself uh, in the forest um, waiting for um, a, a rendezvous with, with a much younger um, woman. Um, and he's writing about how um, intricately Verdi um, paints a portrait of, of what's happening at that moment. Um, and and as, as Falstaff is in, in, the, um, in the forest, he hears the town clock striking midnight. Um, Verdi weaves together three elements. There is the bell ringing after each hour with the same note, F, F, F just literal time. 
After each bell, we hear Paul's staff sounding off with the hours uno, do, tre. And here you have to appreciate Verdi's dramatic cunning and empathy, his awareness that Falstaff needs to hear his own voice in the darkness, counting as a form of reassurance, as a protective spell. The third and last element is the most extraordinary, a series of chords, all including the bell's recurring F. Verdi uses that unvarying tone as a hinge to reveal the wildest possibilities. Dissonances emerge from nowhere, interpreting the monotone of time. A sharp makes one hour feel shocking. A flat makes the next one feel painful or shaded with regret. At the 12th hour, Verdi arrives at F major. But what an F major. Because of the progression into it, the normal chord has been transformed into something uncanny. Grand and regal, like Father Time, but impassive and even a little bit threatening. You get both the fullness of the hour and a sense of remove from human concerns. It certainly gives no comfort to Falstaff, who waits there, quivering for fear in the dark. But Verdi isn't quivering with fear. At 84, the master stare down death and counts gloriously down to midnight. Um, you know, what I, what I think is so great about that passage is Jeremy talks about a single note being put into a different context over and over again and how that different context changes the meaning of the music. Um, and I think that's such an important um, point to make about music. Um, it's also one of the greatest passages, you know, of a God that plays. Is. And I, yeah, I, I hope that I caught some of the... You know, did some justice to it, but um, I was talking about that's in a chapter on rhythm. You know, I'm talking about all these places because all my teachers would write on my music when I was a child. Count, you know, count, and they'd circle it, you know, with three exclamation points and red ink and blue ink. And it's like, well, counting seems like such a heartless thing to have to do to music, right? But then you find all these places in opera, like mm -hmm. at the, even the beginning of Marriage of Figaro. You know, that's what Figaro is doing. He's counting the. In, he's measuring the inches for his wedding bed and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then this amazing place where Falstaff's counting to midnight. And it's full of terror and wonder and time and all these things. So, I, I, yeah, sorry, I had to put it in a little context, yeah. why, why I got on the subject of that place, too. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, one of the, the points that Schnabel makes in his book is um, he talks about how important it is um, for musicians to be, and how musicians used to be, um, writers, composers, and performers, all, all three. And that this idea of being all three went away in the 20th century when specialization, you know, sort of took hold. Um, but I'm, I'm just wondering about you in writing. Was it something that you always did? Um, well, I, w I was an obsessive reader as a child and then, mm -hmm. like, like many, you know, <laughs> slightly problem children, you know. Uh, and then when I started having proper English classes in junior high and high school, uh, I became unbelievably close to my English teachers, maybe in some occasions even closer than to my piano teacher. Um, and then I had all these writing assignments and I applied myself to them with trem tremendous and ridiculous zeal, you know. And I wrote like three cantos of Dante's Inferno, you know, that, new ones, you know, for punishing, you know, schoolyard bullies and other people that I didn't like, and uh, in, in the rhyme, you know, in the triple rhyme or whatever, so, uh, yes, I was, you know, but then I was like, well, I have to be serious about the piano in my 20s, you know, and I, I didn't write that much, you know, I was practicing. Uh, and in my early 30s, I started this blog at the encouragement, with the encouragement of my friend Anya. Uh, and I was like, oh yes, this is a valve. I can release some of the things that are stressful about piano playing and also write about music in ways that you know, don't fit into the normal venue you know, and not into a program noter. Mm -hmm. So it's been about you know, now, yeah, that's two, two, two decades ago. So I guess I've been writing for a little while. Yeah. <laughs> um, you also talk a lot in the book about technique and um, developing technique and attaining technique. Um, and I, I was really um, struck with um, the passage you wrote about um, doing those finger exercises of Dafnani's and how 
somehow doing these rote, or I think you called it a new horizon in boredom, yes. these, these exercises, but that somehow by, by doing these exercises and the repetition, you were, you didn't use the word finger training, but, but you were finger training, and, and then something sort of magical occurred that you referred to as transference. Can you talk about that? I guess I can. It's a, it's a very vivid memory that I have of my, you know, you don't often notice when you're getting better at the piano. You just kind of are day by day, right? In this kind of incremental geological time or whatever it is, right? But then I think when you're, when you're little, this happened when I was 11 or 12, you know, and I had been assigned a little Mozart sonata and it had some little kind of passages, you know, at the end of the exposition or whatever. And, and I'd, Bill had made me do, and he made me use my brain, you know, it's like, you can't do these, first of all, you have to play these exercises, which are the most boring exercises ever written, and not only that, you have to concentrate only on them and your muscles for this period of time when you're working on them, and you can't read anything, or you, know, you can't just be, just how do they move, and, and, and I was doing them, and I didn't notice anything, right? But then, you know, three weeks in or whatever, I'm in my, this little room that I had, which had a nice view of the cactuses outside and the mountains. It was, it was kind of a nice sunset, jackrabbits going by. So I started, I was playing that little ba da ba ba and each finger lifted and brought the next finger down. There wasn't like a struggle. It's just like each finger's motion engendered the next. Mm -hmm. And it was like I was being played, in a way, more than playing. Um, and I thought that was pretty cool. And I thought, oh yeah, I'm not bad. I'm not, I, can, I can play this instrument, you know? Uh, and I wandered around the room a little bit. I was like, oh, because I think a lot happened in that little period of time for me, especially the first two years in New Mexico, yeah. And, and did that eureka moment fuel you? I mean, once you discovered that, you know, you were being played, and, I mean, did that, did that sort of generate more interest and excitement for moving on? Yes, of course it did, yeah. But, that, but you know, then what happens is, as a teacher should, you know, they keep giving you pieces that are a little too hard for you, right, mm -hmm. year by year, you know, right. to stretch you. So and in within two or three years, I was playing the Waldstein Sonata, which I was not quite ready, to, you know? And so there was a joy of discovery and then also a lot of frustration of like, how the hell am I gonna play this, you know, um, next piece? So there's a mixture then, yeah. Sense of sometimes beating your head against the wall. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. Um, in, in the book, you, you talk about perfection and I think at one point you, you say, per Perfection can be a deadly weakness, and um, it was part of a section where you were recalling um, an incident actually at, at the Perlman Theater here in Philadelphia. That's true, that's right. Um, can, you, can you talk about what happened then and, and, and sort of how it helped you evolve? You know, I'd been thinking about Shebuk a lot um, and reconstructing some of these lessons. I think it was in the context of sort of writing that. New Yorker piece, right? And and, um, and it's not that easy, you know, when you're writing, writing is supposed to be super vulnerable, right? And and playing the piano is not supposed to be quite, or it's harder to play the piano in public that vulnerably. At home, it's fine, you, you can be, but on stage, you have to cultivate. So anyway, I, I had all these Shebuck lessons running through my head, and and I was playing, I think I was playing Davidsbundler dances, and I, and I lifted my arm, and I came down, and you know, just like every wrong note came out for a measure, and I was like, it was very unexpected, because, you know, I put my arm down to play those notes a hundred times and never really missed them. So those are the really alarming moment, you know. Um, and and uh, I had, you know, I don't know, 10 seconds of semi-panic, and then luckily I had Shebuck, you know, and Shebuck always said, he had a lovely thing for that, that um, you know, it's great when you miss the first note in a concert because you no longer have the desire to be perfect, right? <laughs> and now you can actually make music. You can breathe and you can do things at the piano. And you don't, you don't have this, um, which you hear in some performances sometimes, right? This kind of, um, 
don't you don't want to let the possibility of error in. I think a lot of Heifetz performances are great in that sense that they have that you know, glittering, you know. Mm. But then, then it's so different when you listen to Chrysler or someone. You know what I mean? It, mm. Who has a different ethos and a, so different kind of possibilities enter the the musical discourse. Yeah. And uh, so yeah, Shabak used to say, and that, so that comforted me, and I was able to play the rest of the concert. Luckily. Which was good because I think I had the Goldberg variations on the second half, so I calmed down by then. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, I, I was interested in how you you talked about how certain composers cycled in and out of your your repertoire, and Chopin was a composer you had a lot of success with early on, and then you say that now you're very reluctant to play Chopin, um, but you didn't really explain why. Yeah, there's a lot of things I didn't explain in the book for all its 300 pages. That's why uh, we're but here. that's <laughs> um, I'm feeling like first of all I'm probably going to try to play some more Chopin in the in the near future. Um, and I love it because you feel like it's taking I feel like when I play Chopin it's like taking my whole um, piano mechanism in for an oil change. Yeah, every, everything gets lubricated and you know, and, and Chopin requires certain kind. Of, it's such an unbelievable attention to the you know kind of aerodynamics of the arm and the the quality, the pillowy quality of the the main voice. You know, it just happened. You know that I pursued one or another thing. You know, I was doing a lot of Bach for a while, and I loved that. And I was doing the Ligeti Etudes, and that was incredible fun. And once I learned those, you know, you had to play them, and 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 I didn't. I didn't know that I, I felt, you know, like for example, and I say felt since a little kid, I felt Mozart was an area where I just felt incredible freedom and I could say something in that music that many other pianists maybe weren't saying. I wasn't sure I had something to say about Chopin for a long time that, <laughs> that other pianists weren't already saying, you know what I mean? I would love to play Chopin beautifully, but I didn't feel I had this kind of take on it. Um, not that I don't love the music, you know. Um, it's, it would be a real toss-up for me. I got in real trouble with Mitsuko Uchida one night. I said, if I had to discard Mo or Chopin or Schubert, I would have a hard time choosing. And she was so mad. <laughs> She's like, you keep Schubert, no question. Are you kidding me? <laughs> but Chopin also does certain things. You know, Sch Schubert obviously does communicate some parts of the human condition that are so uncanny and important, the sense of terror, but, and also the, you know, this fragile, fragile beauty. But Chopin has his things to say, too, that, that are a part of us, yeah. Anyway, yeah. that's a long answer to your question. No, yeah, that, I don't know. I did play the D-flat prelude a lot when I was a kid, and I always got a lot of nice comments for it. And I loved it. Yeah. yeah. Um, you've mentioned your, your mentors here quite a bit, um, and I'm wondering the role that they play in your mind now. Do they stay with you? Was there a, a specific point at which you just felt more independent? You were thinking about them less? Um, just how do, they, how do they sort of live in your head now? Yeah, they come in and out, I'd say, like, you know, radio stations, yeah. They come in and out. I mean, Shevok, I think, you know, from the book, probably, the two teachers that had the most kind of world-changing effect or on my piano playing were Norman Fisher, who was a cello professor at Oberlin, and, and then Shevok, who was obviously a pianist. And, and what Norman brought to me was a, as a, an actor's sense. Uh, he wanted, it was funny, I had all these teachers for all the years that wanted me to observe every single marking on the score, right? You do this slur, do this staccato, do the metronome marking, do the dynamics, you know? And that's fabulous, so important. Almost nothing that Norman talked about was written in the score, per se. It was all, in a way, deduced, like, this is what the music is thinking, it's trying to do, like, like you're, King Lear, you know, or 
whatever protagonist you want to be, why is the music doing it? What are the motivations? You know? mm -hmm. Where is it headed? Is the, is the music in doubt? Is the music certain? Is the, you know? And then, so, and once I got a taste of that, I was like, oh yeah, that, that's important. You, know? mm -hmm. you have to inhabit the score in a certain way. You have to believe in, you know, probably the word we'd use for that is character when you're coaching a young musician. You know, what is the character? Here, mm. right? Is it... Um, and then Shebuk, and so that stuck with me and I think that's really an essential part of who I am and I still am incredibly grateful. I hope that it comes across in the book that I'm writing a thank you to him about that. Um, and how he did it, which was amazing. And then Shebuk was about, it's, it's too, you can't really summarize. Shebuk is a whole world of European understanding and elegance and the importance of small distinctions and, and each composer having a grammar, a kind of style, and you have to be truthful to it. Mm. And you have to, you have to, you have to use time and color to, um, you know, his most frequent comment to me when I came in to play something, he's like, it sounds like the scaffolding is still up <laughs> around your piece, you know? And it's like, you have to find a way to take the scaffolding away and let the piece kind of um, stand there. Yeah. I, that's a long, sorry. That, um, no. I hope that answers your... Absolutely, you know. absolutely. You know, one of the things I, I love about the book is the way you let readers into the, the voices that are going on in your head mm -hmm. um, at certain points. And um, there was a point, I, I think you were preparing the Brahms second piano concerto and you're talking about some of the voices that were going on in your head. And I just think it's, it's really, a, it's a fascinating window. Um, as I tried to smooth the lumps as if the piano were making mashed potatoes, I had to ping pong between mind and muscle. I'd think first, cross the thumb, then I'd play. Quickly back from body to mind, evaluating how my arm felt. Did I press my fourth finger? Any tingles or aches? I wish life wasn't this way, but too bad, now it was. Grow up, Jeremy. I wished music was just thought and desire, and muscles had nothing to do with it. At some point every morning, a twinge would race up my arm, and I would run out of the room and freak out staring at the grass, letting my arms dangle from my sides. Then I'd talk myself back in. Okay, you can still play, try again. Um, and I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about how much piano playing is, is about technique and interpretation and, and preparation, and how much of it is, is the, the psychological that goes on in your mind. You know. Yeah, I wish I'd, I wish <laughs> an ever-changing percentage of all those in the constantly shifting mm. uh, diabolical cocktail of, of, of uh, you know, uh, when you think you've got one settled and it suddenly, you know. Um, in that particular case, um, I was in a very complicated state of mind because I had, you know, decided to learn basically every piece ever written as a junior in college. Um, including many of the hardest pieces for the piano. And um, I was good at sight reading, right? So I could sort of get my way through these pieces, but I wasn't thinking at all about how my hands were doing it. Right? There was no time. So I injured myself, and pretty seriously, for, for a few months. I had a fourth finger, and it was kind of wiggling and on its own, and it tingled, and it, it was bad. And, and I had some fear that I would never play again, like, like happened to many um, young pianists. Every year, a couple of pianists would vanish and they would never come back because they had practiced whatever it was too many times and they injured themselves or, or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. So that was my moment there of and the very vivid memory day after day you know, coming to grips as a you know, seemingly invincible 19-year-old with the fact that you play the piano with your body, and your body's limits are part of the act of playing the piano, and there's no getting around it, you know? You mm. can't just pretend that that's not the way that it is. Um, and having to figure out 
you know, which was the lesson of that summer that often when you do the physically right thing, the healing muscular thing, the music tends to sound better also. <laughs> like there's this beautiful confluence of technical elegance and musical excellence. And that's one of the things that Shebuk also started working with me on. So, you know, that summer was a psychological nightmare, but I was determined, you know, and which is ridiculous too also. You know, I decided to heal my hand by learning one of the hardest piano concertos in the piano repertoire. Maybe the hardest one, right? Uh, and, and so I don't know, I just, by sheer will, you know, and patience and determination. And, uh, and of course I was 19, so I could maybe get away with it a little bit now. Um, there, there was something that um, Shibuk did in, in one of your lessons that I think you referred to as a, one of his superlative parlor tricks. <laughs> yes, and, right. And, and, and I, I just think it, it was one of these um, inside baseball things that is, is so fascinating and, and so terrific that you let the reader in on because it's something as, a, as an audience member you would never have known was happening, but he actually showed you how to achieve a crescendo on a sustained note on the piano, which seems physically impossible. You know, you put your, your finger on a note, it, it, there's only one way it can go, it decays. Uh, and yet, Shibok, in, in a lesson with Jeremy, showed him that that wasn't so. And could you talk about that? You know, that was, in the, that was the first piece I ever heard him play, it was the Mozart C minor sonata, K457. And there's a beautiful slow moment that is more or less a what Shiba called a, um, a Don Juan serenade, a long breathed serenade melody full of seductive bits and, and little bird calls and night music and sounds. Anyway, it's a place. Um, where is that place? It's a, it, the, the phrase blossom and leaps down an octave. And then you change, the, the ch harmony changes from a G to an A flat underneath. And if you listen and pay attention just the right way, you land on that E flat, doo, and underneath there's a G that goes to an A flat. And once you change the harmony, the top note hears the other, it, maybe because the fifth overtone, it begins to vibrate against the fifth below it. If you play it a certain way, the note that's held grows like a singer's would grow. You know? right. And he showed me that he did it several times, you know, and I couldn't reproduce it, you know, but I was like, holy crap, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and like, you know, there was a level of subtlety also, you know, about caring about these tiny, you know, most people might not even know that it happened, right? But when you heard it, it was so precious and it mm. changed the way the phrase ended, you know? The, then he's like, oh yes, and you notice if that happens, I left that out of the book, as you said, if you hear that change, the little crescendo, you know exactly when to play da -da 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 -dum -bum -bum, the little tag at the end of the phrase. Because oh, yeah. the sound, you hear it, and it goes and you put the next thing right in the place. Right? And then you're not, you don't have to worry about when to play, you just listen. Right? You don't even have to count in a certain way. Right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's a very, that was a wonderful lesson. He had that, he was a especially in his studio, up close. Mm -hmm. uh, he had that way of, of creating these little sound magic moments. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, we definitely want to get to um, audience questions. I don't know how we're doing on time. Um, let me just see. Maybe, maybe I'll do one more question with Jeremy and then we'll take some questions from the audience because that's always the best part. Um, I, I wondered about, you know, a lot has happened over the past couple of years with COVID and um, Me Too and Black Lives Matter. The, you know, it's like we've been hunkering down during this pandemic and, and the world has been changing. And I'm wondering if it has changed any of your thinking about um, how a recital is constructed and, and how it's presented and, and the composers that you play or 
anything about your thinking about as as we reemerge, you know, is is are your recitals going to be different in any way? I've been trying baby steps. Um, I was playing this during that summer. The, I was I created this little Black Lives Matter program, which I've been playing. Um, and it does seem to me that you know when you're making these programs, they have to be super thoughtful to avoid various traps. You know. Um, And, and also, it's, it's really challenging and interesting to try to take the established icons of the repertoire and pair them with pieces that sometimes seem almost inimical to them, or you know what I mean? The pieces that question the very nature of quote unquote classical music. I think those programs can be really interesting, but they have to be really well done, and I'm still kind of crafting some for upcoming seasons. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot of great, great music that we tend to not do out of fear or, you know, habit, right? Mm -hmm. Combination of things, you know, there's so many, like I'm fascinated, there's a, the, you know, uh, Ruth Crawford Seeger wrote a lot of beautiful piano music that you, you never hear, for example, for mm -hmm. one small example. I played some Clara Schumann that, Never hear. There's the the Fanny Mendelssohn seasons. Have you heard that piece? Yeah, yeah. It's fascinating, right? I mean, you, maybe you don't want to hear it every day, but you you want to hear it sometimes, right? It's music of great, um, and it does seem shocking that we've managed to. Uh, but you know, there's all kinds of human reasons why that happens too. So I'm <laughs> I'm sympathetic to the whole, you know, I'm sympathetic also to the plight of the classical presenter, right? Mm -hmm. Who are trying to create concerts that people will enjoy, and it's not always easy. So yeah. um, I think it seems like a lot of institutions are making taking a lot of steps to, to be creative. But it's, it's, again, it's not as easy as it seems. Even just creating a good piano recital program for me causes a tremendous anxiety. <laughs> uh, you know, I did the, I did the you know, the, Hammer Clavier and the Concord Sonata for a while. And I was like, well, that's a cool program, you know? And, and presenters wanted that program for some weird reason, you know? Uh, and, and after that, it's like, how do you top that? You, know, you can't really, right? And then I came up with that program for Lincoln Center, which went from 1300, you know, to the present day in two hours, right? Mm -hmm. Which I really enjoyed putting together and almost killed me, you know, trying to <laughs> change styles every three minutes basically for two hours, right? And, and uh, I was like, well, how can I do, <laughs> you, know, you can't really, you know, that program seemed like, you know, the end of the line. So it's, it's um, when the young artists are creating their programs, you have to understand that it's, um, it's work, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then you have to learn the pieces, too, on top of it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, my question is just, I'm sure a lot of people would like to know what was, when you were 19 years old, the uh, curative hardest, hardest thing ever written that you mended your finger on? Oh, I, I was playing the Brahms Second Piano Concerto in B flat major, um, opus 83. That yeah. is the hardest thing. It's one, I would say it's one of the hardest piano concertos. You know, people always talk about Rachmaninoff Third and Prokofiev Second. If you looked at the technical difficulties in that Brahms concerto, I think they're comparable to, and they're weirder. You know, there, there's a, the famous passage, you know, in the Brahms where in the second movement, you know, the orchestra is doing yum bum 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 bum, then, then the piano comes in, pianissimo octaves, both hands, pianissimo legato. What a jerk, right? Right? But what a deal, right? Like in both hands, you know. Uh, and it's really, it's leaping all over, you know? Um, so that kind of thing. And there's a place in the last movement, too, where you play, you know, the orchestra is to bup, ba da ba da and you go all in thirds, you know, as fast as humanly possible. It's supposed to sound like the most, you know, gossamer, evanescent thing you ever, but actually that's one of the hardest. <laughs> it's ridiculous, right? Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to rank these pieces, but, you know, Brahms B-flat is... Pretty intense. Well, 
I think if you read the book, you'll be aware that I, my decision-making processes were not always tremendous. Um, <laughs> they were mysterious <laughs> and partial. Um, to be fair, though, it was the first piece that I fell in love with that I had decided I love this piece the most of all when I was, I don't know, 13. Um, I felt that that piece had an integrity and a nobility that was so important. You know? Not that I was like this incredibly noble 13-year-old kid, you know, but for me that was like it was that piece had values or something. And so when I came to it, it was like it was a piece that I wanted to play more than anything else in the world. Yeah. So I think that caused me to make that decision. Yeah. Could you speak a little about how you feel about the directions that new music, new classical music is going toward? Um, uh, new classical music, uh, first of all, I'll say, and I, I, I don't say this to be contrarian or in any way um, difficult. Unfortunately, we're stuck with the term classical music, right? But it's a very suspect term, you know? Um, well, I use it all the time, right? Uh, I think it's especially suspect when you start talking about music in our time, right? Because um, I think one of the maybe sort of points of my recital program when I traced music history is, is for a long time you have a sense of a sort of a shared style, at least somewhat shared, right? Like, and in the last half of the 20th century, classical music or art music or whatever, you know, you'll have at one hand Stockhausen writing, whatever Stockhausen is writing, you'll have the same time Philip Glass writing, right? So there's no, that's not a common language anymore, right? It's, 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 um, it's a true um, welter of voices, right? I think if you look at contemporaries of Beethoven, excuse me if I'm wrong about this, I mean, in, in Beethoven's world, in the Western European environment, we're not confusing it night right now with, with the larger question of, uh, and there was all this different music, of course, being made, but um, generally, music sounded a little bit like Beethoven. <laughs> Maybe a little bit more Italian than Beethoven, generally at that time, right? right. A little bit more operatic, um, lighter, but the style was closer, right? And now, um, I think a lot of young composers struggle in many ways. I don't know if you have this sense, too, like, what, what's, how do I even have a language to write in, right? Um, and in a way, that's a real opportunity, and in a, in a way, it's a terrifying, um, in a way, Beethoven was lucky. He had a Mozart and Haydn. He's like, oh, I'm going to take what they did, and I'm going to do something to it, right? And, I, and I'm going to enlarge it. I'm going to tweak it. I'm going to expand the time scale, and I'm going to, you know, but I'm going to work with what they had as a foundation, and I'm going to just ride it to the end of the line, right? This is the way I see it, you know. So, um, yeah. They don't have that luxury now exactly. Um, yeah, you know. I, I think if there's one idea that seems to be dominant now, it's, it's the idea that a lot of the extremely harsh dissonance that was fashionable through, you know, say the 1970s or the early 80s, um, composers are shying away from that extremely dissonant language now. There's, you know, there was a famous essay that, that Milton Babbitt wrote that was called Who Cares If You Listen. <laughs> he, he didn't actually write the title of the essay himself. It was an editor who wrote the title. But, but that was the basic idea that, that art music for a time was going in a direction in which it wasn't necessarily for the listener, that composers were writing for each other or for aficionados. And I think the, the one general theme that has emerged over the past maybe decade or so is a greater acknowledgement of, of the audience and, and where the audience's ear is in terms of um, being able to sustain harsh dissonance. So, you know, I think that composers feel very comfortable now writing in um, sort of a traditional tonal language with dissonance, you know, used sort of more strategically, but, but not as the overarching um, idea. 
Is that your impression? I, I think absolutely true, and it, it, there's so much more to, to um, you know, it, it's just, <laughs> you know, there was a, you know, there was a through line of like, well, let's make it more and more dissonant and more dissonant and more dissonant, and that, that has come to an end. But on the other hand, um, you know, there's the, all the question marks. And, but, but also, and I'll shut up after this, it, it all changes if you consider that a great deal of the popular music we are hearing over the last 40 years, some of that is classical music already, right? In, in, in an important way, like that, that's art music. Maybe not all of it, you know, in the same way that not all the music from 1800 we love the same way. But, but um, and I think some young composers are trying to use popular music and build on that style to create things. And I, I think that seems like a wise approach to me. Yeah. Could you talk about your practice sessions, the components, if you have standard components of your practice session, and what you look forward to the most? What I look forward to most in practicing? <laughs> <laughs> What's your instrument, Peter? Are you? It was French horn. Your French horn. It was. That's a tough instrument. Yeah. Um, actually, these days I look forward to practicing more than I did when I was a child by leaps and bounds. Um, a lot of my practicing is um, trying to find my physical center, yeah? trying to create a sense of maybe what Shebuck would talk about, the sort of like simplest possible motions <laughs> to create the musical effect that I'm after. And then I would say 8% of the time, I'm singing to myself how it ought to go so that I don't forget. You know, I'm doing all this physical work. I was like, no, how do you want it to be? Do that. Um, a fair amount of that 92% of time is, and this is my rule for myself now, which seems to work okay, and I tell that to the young, youngsters too. You never play anything again until you describe to yourself physically what you're going to do differently the next time to fix the next, the, you know. Am I going to lift my pinky more or, you know? Be very specific, you yeah? Because there's this danger when you're practicing, you go over the same thing, you basically practice in um, habits and, and things. And I look forward in practicing, you know, of course I look forward to when it sounds good, uh, you know? <laughs> and that happens and then it has this mysterious thing, it's like, what did I do? Then there's a period of fear where you're trying to recreate it. And if you can do it again to a second and third time, that's really what to look forward to. And of course, beer afterwards. I was interested to hear you make reference to a composer's grammar. And of course, you're, you are a literary person. So I'm wondering, do works, say, like the Concord Sonata or other works that have literary inspiration, do these have special meaning to you? Are you more attracted to them? Or, or actually, is, is it a problem for you? That's a good question. Um, I, 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 I'll confess, yes, like a piece like the Concord Sonata that has a literary program. I like that. I feel I, I can really, and Schumann often, right? And so those, those pieces, you're playing the piano, but you're also just reciting a poem in a certain way, or you're telling this very bizarre, fantastical story, and and, Beethoven, you're often storytelling too, but it's much more like, um, <laughs> like an action movie. Like things have to lead to things, right? <laughs> you can't just wander off and like enjoy a moment for all. You have to really like stay with the plot, you know. Um, Ives, you don't really have to stay with the plot, you know. You do you to the extent that there is a plot, you know. You have to you have to create this kind of universe of sound and ideas. Um, I do like those kind of. It's true. Yeah. But what what Shebuck meant though with the grammar. Um, is often very simple. He wanted to know which notes were up and which notes were down. Right? Which were down beats. In Mozart's is really important. Yeah. You can hear the most, people can play all the right notes, everything in tune in Mozart, but if, 
if the ups aren't up and the downs aren't down, it's going to sound terrible. You know? and, you, and you hear that more than I'd like to say. Um, Mozart's very delicate that way. If, if, the, if the dancer lands on the wrong foot, it doesn't. Yeah. And one presumes, like, because we're in our modern world or whatever, you know, people in Mozart's time that was so built into, they understood this. You know, that, that, that was the language, right? But now it's hard to, we have to go back and excavate. And that's, that was the kind of thing he was talking about, often about grammar. Are there any uh, contemporary composers that you have the same emotional or intellectual attachment to than you obviously do with the, let's say, pre-1950s? Composers going back to the 16th, 17th, 18th century. Yes, yeah. I, I did all the Ligeti etudes, for example, for a while. I, 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 you know, a lot of people think Ligeti is kind of a. I don't know how you feel about this, um, and I understand why they think this. That Ligeti is all glittering surface and technique, um, but I feel there's a real visceral, emotional substance there that's kind of stunning, you know, like when you play it. Um, to be fair, Ligeti is not a composer who's trying to get rid of the past so much. He's very um, deferential to Chopin and Debussy, and he's still, he's still in touch with all those folks in a way that many people find upsetting too, right? Like he's not. Um, but, you know, I, I like you know, I've played a lot of John Adams over the years, and, and I've enjoyed that too. That's a different. Then I'm getting in 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 sync with and Edchevsky sometimes too. Yeah, and even like um, well, I li I like the the crazy composers too. Yeah, <laughs> Lou, Lou Harrison's no longer with us, but. Meredith Monk, okay, kind of, kind of. She's she's crazy in the best. You know, when it's hard to know how to put the piece together, and you have to figure it out. I really enjoy that too. Yeah, you know, like how do you make try to solve it? My question for you is that you said at one point um, in the interview that if you were to go back to Chopin, you would want to find something new to say about it. And my question for you is, um, what's your process for figuring out what you want to say? That, uh, thank you for that. I, I'm not even sure that I would want to find something new to say about it. Um, I, it, when I play Mozart, you know, the phrases, I feel a little bit like a jazz pianist. Like I can almost, because Mozart uses very simple elements, right? And he riffs on them, right? And he, and, and I, I feel like I can, in real time, be a part of that process when I'm playing Mozart. And I, you know, my, when I feel my best about playing Mozart, and then I feel like I'm really contributing something to, um, to that music, that's, that's what I feel. And I think that's what I would like to bring to Chopin if I played it. Um, it yeah, that's that sort of improvisatory. Um, you know, he, one of my heroes for Chopin. I don't know. Do you know these records of Ignaz? I talk about it in the book. Ignaz Friedman. If you've never heard Ignaz Friedman play Chopin in your lives, then you need to make that a point. I was having a walk with Emmanuel Axe two days ago, and he said, "Yes, Ignaz Friedman is." You know, so some other people agree. Richard Good, I know, also agrees. Um, Friedman had a rhythmic freedom that is astonishing, on top of this technique, which was ridiculous, you know. Um, but this kind of joyous rubato, you know, and he, it doesn't sound like anybody else's Chopin. Nor does it sound like he's doing something new to Chopin. Right? He's just inhabiting it. I guess is what I'd say, I'm, if I'm going to be opinionated, which I am. Well, 
We'll, we'll know when you get there, when we start seeing Chopin <laughs> on your recitals, we'll understand something about the, the process that, that got him there. Mm -hmm. So, Jeremy, thank you very much. Peter, thank you. Thank you, thank you for your questions.